Chapter 8 of Tilda Jane's Orphans. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jenny McCann. Tilda Jane's Orphans by Marshall Saunders. Chapter 8 Mild Forgiveness. Grandpa was poorly. He had had more bad nights than usual lately, and very often, when the morning came, he was not able to leave his bed. "'And it's such a shame, cause we're having such a nice thaw,' murmured Tilda Jane, "'and the weather is so soft. You ought to be out drinking in this sweet air, like the cow and milkweed in the yard, and the dogs and pigeons and sparrows.' She was trying not to harden her heart against Mr. Waysmith. For a few days after her interview with him, she had had a lingering hope that he might come and say he had forgiven poor Grandpa. But he had not done so. He had not called, he had not written, he had sent no message. Well, she had done her duty, and she was glad to hear through the Melanson's that young Waysmith went no more to the bad Cajuns. His father had stopped that, so she had done some good. One fine Saturday afternoon she was in Grandpa's room. She had been reading the Bible to him, and now sat with the book open on her lap, thoughtfully gazing out at the sociable milkweed, who had come from the barn, and stood in the sunny yard outside with her head close to the window. She was eating, one by one, a row of sweet apples that Tilda Jane had placed on the sill, and occasionally the little girl's loving glance wandered from her and across the yard down French Row, where the big yellow sun was slipping behind the houses to the pine wood along the river. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. The words were a mockery to poor Grandpa, with his deadly fear of Mr. Waysmith, and he had been listening to her with his face turned toward the wall. There's a ring at the front door, he said presently, and as if grateful for the interruption. Tilda Jane started. She had been so absorbed in her musings that she had not heard it, and stumbling over Grandpa's crutches, she hurried from the room. To her surprise and utter paralysis of tongue, a condition of things that did not often overtake her, she was confronted by Mr. Waysmith. "'Good afternoon,' he said politely, and slightly smiling at her confusion. "'Is Mr. Dilson in?' "'Yes, sir,' stammered Tilda Jane. "'May I see him?' and as she silently turned, he stepped after her into the house. Tilda Jane left him in the parlor and hurried back to the bedroom. "'Grandpa, dear,' she said, so eagerly that her words tripped over each other, "'Mr. Waysmith's here, and he wants to see you, and I can bring him in, can't I?' Grandpa's pale face grew paler. In all the years of his retirement the rich merchant had not once called to ask after his health. But he had better see him now. There might be some question of his pension at stake. "'Let him in,' he said shortly, and Tilda Jane hastened back to the parlor. "'Grandpa'll see you, sir. Please step this way.' How had she ever dared to speak as familiarly to this man as she had done a few days ago? There was something exceedingly awe-inspiring about him, and hearing his heavy tread behind her, she shivered and murmured, "'I feel as if there was a monument pacing after me.' When they reached the bedroom door, Mr. Waysmith turned to her. "'My son is out in the sleigh. He has a small parcel for you. Perhaps you will go and get it.' Tilda Jane took the hint given and hurried out to the big, handsome sleigh, where a dignified coachman sat stiffly holding the reins. After a hasty glance at the two powerful black horses, Tilda Jane nodded in a somewhat preoccupied fashion to Datus, who was lounging on the back seat. He took off his cap and held it in his hand, as if she were the grandest lady in Siskaset. Then, seizing a parcel, he sprang out of the sleigh and said, "'Let us go in the house. You may get cold out here.' Tilda Jane preceded him up the short walk to the front door, and ushered him into the little parlor, that to the lad seemed very amusing with its fiery red carpet and funeral black haircloth furniture. "'Here's your present,' he said, handing her the parcel. Mama and Papa have been in Boston, and they bought it for you. Won't you sit down? 
asked the little girl soberly, and seating herself on the shiny sofa, she unfastened string and paper, and then gave a gasp of pure ecstasy. Before her was a good-sized pink silk-lined work basket, with pockets, pincushions, scissors, thread, needles, silver thimble, and many other conveniences for an expert needlewoman. After a while the blissful little girl got her breath and burst forth into ejaculatory remarks that Datus listened to with an amused grin, storing them in his memory to repeat to his mother. "'Won't I darn now! Won't I make Grandpa's socks look fine! And Hank's! Won't I mend their shirts and coats and everything! I'll sew like the wind!' Finally, her strong business instinct asserting itself, she said, "'Now, who do you say I am to thank for this beauty thing?' "'My mother and father.' "'Well, will you tell your mother, please, that I've never had a thing that gave me such happy pain? "'Cause if I'd had a real mother, this is likely what she'd have given me.' "'Did you have an unreal mother?' inquired Datus waggishly. "'I was a mistake, I think,' said Tilda Jane wistfully. Some people have children, then they seem surprised-like, as if to say, What in the world did you want to come and bother me for? I didn't intend to bother anyone, she added apologetically, but here I am. What can I do? The petted boy could not in the faintest degree enter into the orphan's feelings, but he felt that she was voicing an inner plaint, and he said consolingly, I'll give my mother your message. She is coming to see you some day. I heard my father ask her. "'Your father asked her?' repeated Tilda Jane slowly. "'Yes, he did.' Tilda Jane wrinkled her forehead thoughtfully. "'Seems to me I size up some folks all wrong. I believe your father is better than he looks.' "'He's the best man in Siskaset,' replied Datus warmly. Tilda Jane said nothing, but went on nursing the pink-lined basket in her arms. After a time she said meditatively, "'He's talking a good while to Grandpa.' I'm glad. Yes, something about business, said the lad carelessly, and he looked bored and went to the window. Tilda Jane put down her basket and said anxiously, Don't you want to come out in the yard and see our new horse? We can go the front way, so we won't break in on your father and grandpa. All right, said Datus, and with the little girl he sauntered out through the garden to the yard. Bonjour, baby called to one of the little Melanson's who was passing along the sidewalk. Tilda Jane turned suddenly, and without premeditation asked, "'How did you learn French?' Datus did not suspect her knowledge of his former visits to the home of the bad Acadian, and with a smile informed her that he used to have some French friends, but now he had cut their acquaintance. Tilda Jane would not pursue so dangerous a topic of conversation, and saying hastily, I suppose such as you always have to study languages. She launched into an enthusiastic description of the good qualities of the beautiful milkweed who was coming to meet them. While she and Datus were chatting briskly, the two elder persons were confronting each other in mutual embarrassment. They really had little to say, and after a polite inquiry as to the state of his pensioner's health and another remark with regard to the beauty of the day, Mr. Waysmith lapsed into silence. Grandpa lay quietly in the bed, and the Bible that Tilda Jane had left open near him caught Mr. Waysmith's attention. Taking it up, his eye fell on a verse. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your father forgive your trespasses. That covered the case, and to expedite matters he read it aloud. Grandpa looked at him strangely. What had come over Mr. Waysmith? An hour ago he would have said it was the most improbable thing in the world that the lumber merchant should be sitting reading the Bible to him. Yet here he was doing it, and seeming quite natural in the act. Dilson, said Mr. Waysmith, as he closed the book and put it back on the bed, I have just come from Boston. Grandpa said nothing, and his caller went on. The object of my journey there was to see Grover, you remember Grover, once your helper at the mill? Grandpa did indeed remember Grover, the assistant bookkeeper in his day, and in a somewhat husky voice said he did. Mr. Waysmith paused a minute. There was something exceedingly pathetic to him in the spectacle of that old white head peeping at him from the cover of the bedclothes. 
The old man's hands had grasped the sheet and drawn it up close under his neck. His attitude was uneasy yet resolved. There was no weakening yet, and his caller went on. Grover and I had a long conversation, and naturally a part of it related to you. As he had been for so long a time intimately associated with you, I asked him whether he agreed with me in forming a high estimate of your honesty and faithfulness when in my employ, and in that of my father. He said that he did. Grandpa was perspiring freely. Little rills of moisture ran down his cheeks, yet he kept the clothes tucked under his neck, and his beady eyes fixed on his visitor. Mr. Waysmith continued meditatively, looking out the window and talking as if to himself. There are several classes of men in the world. One in which I am specially interested is that composed of persons who are, on the whole, models of integrity. Yet at some time in the lives of these good people there will be an unaccountable lapse from this strict integrity, a lapse that only their maker or the devil who tempts them can account for. Grandpa had never been tempted, judging by his unaltered position and expression, and Mr. Waysmith went on. Another class that I am fond of studying is that of persons drifting little by little, thanks to heredity or environment, into fixed and unalterable habits of wrongdoing. They are deceitful habitually. They cannot help themselves, but between them and the occasional sinners who recover themselves nobly, there is, in my opinion, a great gulf fixed. Grandpa had apparently only a distant interest in sinners of any class and rising. Mr. Waysmith said, "'Good-bye, Dilson. I must go. But first let me say something that perhaps may sound impertinent, although it is not meant so, and that also might be taken as too much along the line of guessing for a business man. It is this. Without altering my present opinion of you in the least, I wish to say that if you ever, while keeping my books, made any mistakes of any kind, and thereby fretted yourself into irritation over them, I think that the occasion was not worthy of the results. A frank statement to me would have brought relief. Grandpa did not care for frank statements, unless he was furious with rage, which he certainly never would be with Mr. Waysmith, and, comprehending this, the merchant took a sudden resolution. He had found out what he wished to know. He and Grover had both been mistaken. The little orphan girl with her heart aglow with sympathy and love for Dilson had been right. There was no indifference nor surprise on the old man's face now, as there would have been had his former employer's suspicions been baseless. He was suffering, suffering acutely and visibly, and, accurately guessing at the cause of this emotion, Mr. Waysmith stepped up to his pillow. Dilson, he said kindly but firmly, I have reason to believe that you once, through mistake, design or otherwise, defrauded me of a certain sum of money. How much was it? Mr. Waysmith was standing so close that the beady eyes had to roll upward to look at him. They did not flinch. Grandpa would not confess, neither would he deny. After a long time his former employer's compelling glance overcame him. Two hundred and fifty dollars, he said in a rasping voice. Then his purple lids closed over his eyes. Two hundred and fifty dollars, repeated the merchant. Is one's peace of mind worth so small a sum? Grandpa would not commit himself to an opinion. What was the manner of taking it? inquired Mr. Waysmith sternly. Conscience money, replied Grandpa. Someone had stolen it from me. From your father, former bookkeeper, false entries. What was his name? Percy. And he returned the money to the firm through you, and you kept it? I did. Strange, strange, murmured Mr. Waysmith. Then through the window his eye fell on Tilda Jane and Datus, who, accompanied by the interested milkweed, were feeding the pigeons and sparrows. That girl had rendered him a great service. His son, now that he had come under his direct supervision, was improving, and he was enjoying his companionship. Dilson, he said with sudden animation, and with a brief smile that made his heavy face lovable, who am I that I should appoint myself judge over you? 
I too have to crave forgiveness for sins. I am an egotist, a stubborn worldling. Having been often deceived, I seem to have lost faith in my fellow man. From my heart I forgive you. The money as though it had not been. Put it out of your thoughts. Let your remaining years be happy. Grandpa was not satisfied. Subtract it from pension, he said hoarsely. Your pension is a fair one, said Mr. Waysmith kindly. Yet you would miss that sum. I cannot cut it down. Subtract it muttered the old man. Mr. Waysmith narrowly inspected him. The glistening eyes were distended and unnatural. "'Very well,' he said hastily, but in his own mind a plan to make good the deficiency suddenly unfolded itself. He would place the subtracted sum in the bank to the credit of Tilda Jane. "'That young girl you have with you,' he said, in an interested tone, "'appears devoted to you, and intelligent beyond her years.' "'She told on me,' ejaculated Grandpa. Mr. Waysmith smiled. "'She loves you, Dilson. She was greatly exercised over an endeavor to secure your happiness.' Grandpa expressed no gratitude to Tilda Jane. Indeed, he began to look so strangely that his companion was alarmed. The mental strain of the return to old days and old affairs had been too much for him, and Mr. Waysmith hurried from the room. "'Datus, go for Dr. Gressler,' he said quickly, and without waiting to hear the rest of the order, Tilda Jane dashed into the house. Grandpa was having some kind of a fit, and with a white face she ran for the water bucket. End of chapter 8 Chapter 9 of Tilda Jane's Orphans This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Brandon. Tilda Jane's Orphans by Marshall Saunders. Chapter 9. An Unexpected Request. A few afternoons later, Tilda Jane and Grandpa were sitting in the kitchen. Perletta had gone downtown to buy some sausages for their supper, and Hank had not yet come home from the mill. Grandpa was eyeing the little girl curiously as she sat turning up a hem in the fine warm dressing gown that Hank had recently bought for her. Tilda Jane had her pretty work basket beside her, and as she turned to it for some more thread, she said, "'Tis a pity, Grandpa, that this lovely thing was so long that you tripped on it, but I'm making it all right." Grandpa did not reply at once. His thoughts were in the past. After a time, he said slowly, You told Mr. Waysmith on me. Tilda Jane dropped her work and stared at him. Then she said, Of course I did, and I'm so happy in my mind about it that I don't know what to do. Grandpa frowned and in his turn stared at her. Her face was shrewd but composed, and she was surveying him like a little fox, he muttered. You stole on me at night, he went on grumbling. You listen to talk not meant for your ears. And it ain't the first time. If you did it two years agone. Sure I did, she said eloquently. And I tell you now, as I told you then, could I lie in bed warm and comfy and hear you moaning and crying and fussing in your sleep like a poor dog that has lost her pups? No. I went creepy, creepy downstairs to see if I could do anything for you. I did it two years ago, and I've done it this year, and I'll do it next year, if you go and pick up any more trouble. Don't you dare, said the old man, his face becoming red. You stay in your room at night. All right, Grandpa, she said diplomatically. I guess I'll have no more occasion to roam. You're easy in your mind now, and as quiet as one of Job's mice. I guess that the plague times in your life are all over. You needn't have told, reiterated the old man stubbornly. Oh, Grandpa, said Tilda Jane with animation, and throwing down her work, she rose and stood over him. Some folks are ugly some of the time. Other folks are ugly none of the time. 
but no folks ought to be ugly all the time like you used to be seemed to me that you was going to die and i thought something ought to be done you were like a poor old orphan that had no one to care for you but me i know boys and girls ought to be seen and not heard but what could i do i tried hank with hints thrown out but he wouldn't catch them i suppose you told hank the whole rigmarole said grandpa disagreeably he doesn't even dream of it said tilda jane earnestly i took good care not to blab your sorrows to any one that's why i went myself to mr waysmith you know and he knows and me and god and we'll never tell will we dear and as she spoke she tenderly patted the bald spot on the top of his white head grandpa was silent he was moved despite himself and did not know what to say tilda jane went on soothingly i blame myself for not getting at the root of your trouble sooner i used to think it was that sixty dollars that was bothering you i might have known it wasn't natural for you to be bellerin at me so much of the time and hurling your crutches about and smashing dishes just for sixty dollars grandpa's head drooped a little under tilda jane's caressing touch and he gazed shamefacedly at his crutches it wasn't reason she went on for you weren't a bad enough man to cut up that way and when i found out how i could clear up everything for you wasn't i your little girl bound to stand by you grandpa raised his head tilda jane had done wisely yet he was the man of the house and to prevent this young thing from crowing over him because she had brought him relief he would assert himself a little we'll let bygones be bygones he said stiffly but spying times are over and don't you bother your young head about my affairs any more i've had a way of talking things over in my sleep as i told you two years back i've had it all my life don't you listen any more and he emphasized his remarks by a sturdy tap of one of his crutches on the floor i hear said tilda jane affectionately and i will heed i guess i'll have nothing more to call for spying you're just the best old man in Siskasset now except when the habit of giving a growl comes over you and i hope you'll live to be a hundred i'd like a cup of tea said grandpa gently all right exclaimed tilda jane tea you shall have as long as i'm alive to make it good and strong with the thickest of cream in it and lots of sugar and couldn't you eat a bite of gingerbread with it grandpa just fresh baked i might take a morsel he said obligingly tilda jane ran to put fresh water in the tea kettle and as she set it on the stove she said now grandpa while you drink your tea i'm going to run next door a spell to speak to mrs Meliquan. i'm bothered about her hens they don't seem very fit and she knows a lot about them if you want me just ring the big bell i'll put it beside you open the window and give a good peal i'll not be more than five minutes and perletta likely will be here before i'm back grandpa nodded and a short time later sat alone drinking his tea and thinking gratefully of the little orphan girl who was as attentive and respectful as if she were his own daughter he did not praise her to her face would spoil her he muttered i hate uppish girls strange to say not long after tilda jane stepped out the back door someone rang the bell at the front one who's that said grandpa setting down his empty cup i guess i'll go see i feel fifty per cent better these last few days and seizing his crutches he went nimbly through the narrow hall to the front door to his amazement though he only gazed stolidly before him mr waysmith stood in the doorway with a basket on his arm 
had a smile on his face come in sir said grandpa at last come to the kitchen it's the only warm place in the house and he hobbled before him mr waysmith followed closely and on arriving in the kitchen sat down in a chair just opposite grandpa's own comfortable seat are you alone asked the merchant grandpa nodded so much the better i've brought you something that i dare say will astonish you and he glanced at the basket that he had set close to the stove you can't astonish me said grandpa grimly i'm too old the old have certainly seen many things said mr waysmith calmly yet i dare say when i tell you i have brought you a pup to bring up you'll be a little more than astonished me ejaculated grandpa bring up a pup i hate dogs i know said mr waysmith with a reassuring nod of his head don't be disturbed i will explain i was much struck by that young girl who came to me to speak about your affair he paused and grandpa said stoically tilda jane yes i know i've been making inquiries about her said mr waysmith and i want to say that i am here today for a purely business purpose no philanthropy about it all right breathed grandpa with inward relief she has a most curious insight into animal nature said mr waysmith a sympathetic and strangely understanding insight now my dog there took to her at once your dog repeated grandpa there's no dog here is there tilda jane took hers with her mr waysmith motioned to the darkest corner of the room wait till i get my specs said grandpa and putting them on he to his further amazement discovered the dark and silent muffles lying close against the wall i didn't see him come in said grandpa hardly anyone sees him said the caller he slinks about and lies in corners a dissatisfied employee once entered my office with the intention of terrorizing me by means of a revolver muffles found him out before i did and when the man attempted to draw his weapon from his side pocket the dog's teeth fastened on his wrist the man was so overcome that he fell to the ground grandpa grunted in a lively way and surveyed the dog with new respect and another time when i was in a new york hotel my dog who never seems to sleep sprang on the bed and tore at the sheets the hotel was on fire and with him at my heels i had barely time to get into the street before the building was wrapped in flames any lives lost asked grandpa twenty replied mr waysmith with a contraction of his forehead but enough of these dismal themes i merely wished you to understand that though hardly anyone suspects it i take a profound interest in man's best friend the dog i own some kennels in boston and my dogs are often exhibited now you may know that there are fashions in dogs are there said grandpa i only know one kind of dog the yaller cur he's always with us mr waysmith smiled i go in for thoroughbreds especially the small or toy kind you see that dog muffles though well bred is small for his breed there have been fashions in black and tan toy terriers pug dogs fox terriers bull terriers spitz dogs all kinds of terriers i won't enumerate every variety but a time has come for a new breed and i think we have started it in boston i didn't know you were sporty remarked grandpa mr waysmith at first frowned and then smiled broadly i am not sporty dillson but you know every man likes some interest apart from his work you have little idea when my business is over how absorbed i become in different dog combinations you know to obtain new forms there must be different crosses often inbreeding don't know the terms said grandpa shaking his head 
but go on sir i'm pleased to hear you talk pleased and flattered mr waysmith saw that and with a glow at his heart in consequence of giving the old man pleasure he went on we have i think got what we want at last in a small dog with mostly bulldog characteristics but here is my trouble the men and boys who have to do with the raising of the pups are usually coarse-grained fellows i have tried to get women or girls to undertake the upbringing of the young dogs but while they have sympathy they have not knowledge they don't care for dogs as men do now it occurred to me that this young girl tilda jane who has such an understanding of dog character might successfully raise one of our new puppies and i have brought one of the finest if you tell her to raise him she'll do it said grandpa agreeably i would rather not have my name mentioned in connection with the animal if she knows the dog is for me she will be unduly exercised about it and she is only a young girl i don't want her worried are they worth much asked grandpa when they're brought up mr waysmith smiled and with his eyes on the old man's face said i value that fellow there under the stove at one thousand dollars grandpa almost fell out of his chair a pup he gasped coronation i never heard of such a thing let's have a look at him sir mr waysmith laughed irrepressibly remember dillson he is to be one of the founders of a race then taking up the basket he lifted out a soft pale blue woolen shawl and exhibited a dark brindled pup about eight weeks old grandpa settled his glasses more firmly on his nose and stared with eyes and mouth wide open i want it to be your pup dillson said mr waysmith kindly you give it to the little girl to bring up you can say a friend left it with you then when it is a healthy young dog i will relieve you of the care of it suppose it dies asked grandpa true to his habit of usually looking on the dark side of things not a word will be said except of thanks to you for your attention given it the animal comes of delicate stock i dare say he may die but i shall be very happy if he lives and will reward you handsomely for your trouble tilda jane will do the work said grandpa hastily certainly i understand that but i consider you as a family the pup may be mischievous about the house as a boy i kept dogs said grandpa they used to chew up everything in sight mr waysmith's face darkened i was born with a love for animals but was never allowed to keep a dog possibly that is the reason i am so much interested in them at the present time now i must go i'm glad i happened to find you alone may i leave the pup grandpa did not hesitate an instant you may sir he said with dignity and i'll tell the young girl under my care to do her best for him i'll not inform her of his value twould bow her down with care she'll be just as good to him thinking he's a cur thank you dillson said mr waysmith simply i'm happy to oblige you sir said grandpa and kindly take away that fine basket and this fal de -ral, he said pushing the pale blue shawl with his crutch looks too much like a thousand dollar dog put the creature in my chair i'll get an old shirt to wrap him in mr waysmith with fingers that were tender in their touch lifted the pup to grandpa's warmly padded but certainly not elegant chair then with a backward look at the sleeping creature went slowly toward the front door i wish i had someone in my own house to look after him he murmured to himself but there's no one there that could be bothered with the little fellow i will send you a book about dogs dillson he said aloud the little girl has native good sense 
but she might as well learn something about scientific management don't send it sir leave it at johnson's bookstore and i will call can you walk now asked the merchant in surprise yes sir when there's no ice on the sidewalks but i mostly drive hank's got a horse now i am glad to hear that said mr waysmith heartily and i'm also glad to find you looking so much better than when i was here last grandpa stared painfully at him but there was no significance in mr waysmith's glance and the old man stood contentedly in the doorway and watched him going down the street he hoped that his caller would meet none of the family what a surprise he had for them and he chuckled to himself tilda jane would probably go into hysterics and he hobbled back to the kitchen end of chapter nine recording by john brandon Chapter 10 of Tilda Jane's Orphans. This is a LibriVox recording. All the LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Tilda Jane's Orphans by Marshall Saunders. Chapter 10 The Moneyed Pup. Strange to say, the thing that could not have been more dramatically arranged if Grandpa had had the planning of it himself. Tilda Jane perletta and hank entered the kitchen at the same time hank by the front door tilda jane and perletta by the back one the little girl burst into excuses she was so sorry it had been so long just as she went next door one of mrs melancon's children had pulled over a pot full of boiling water and had scalded himself so she had been obliged to help the mother with the little sufferer there she paused open-mouthed what was that lying on grandpa's chair hank she cried are my eyes playing me a trick or do i see the truth the young man who was putting sundry parcels from his arms to the kitchen table turned and suddenly round his own eyes following the direction of the pointing finger perletta who was hanging her coat and hat on a hook behind the woodhouse door stepped back to the kitchen with a phlegmatic what a screech i thought the house was on fire well i will be switched ejaculated hank if there ain't a pup in my old dog's chair the last place i'd look to see one and he glanced at his father who stood leaning on his crutches surveying his family and the pup by turns father exclaimed hank whose dog is that mine said the man darling darling choked tilda jane excitedly and picking up the small sleepy creature she cuddled it in her arms where did you get it pursued hank friend brought it to me said his father do you calculate to bring it up yes with her help said grandpa nodding towards tilda jane let's have a look at it said hank taking it from tilda jane's affectionate embrace hank's fingers were not ungentle but grandpa called warningly take care i don't want that pup hurt pup hurt repeated hank stupidly you father he lost his senses remarked grandpa and an aside can't talk straight hank heard him and fired up yes i can talk straight sir and i can say what i am thinking what is the sense of all four-legged creatures has possessed you who turn to hurl your crutches at dogs to take a pup to bring up i'd have said you'd bounce it out the window grandpa scarcely listened to him his eyes were on the pup you're mauling him he said young men don't know how to handle dogs give him back to the girl and he pointed to tilda jane who was only too delighted to receive the tiny member of their family come here boys she said seating herself in her own little rocking chair and addressing poacher and gippy come see your new brother the two older dogs approached poacher looked foolish and slunk away he did not want to have anything to do with the newcomer gippy sniffed at him in an amiable fashion and then went to lie under the stove the pup was not old enough yet for them to be jealous of him hank's amazement was very amusing but no one perceived it for everybody was too much taken up with the puppy finally he approached tilda jane and asked humbly if he could let him see what kind of a looking dog it was the pup had got over his sleepy fit and was rolling about the little girl's lap playing with her fingers my stars exclaimed hank what a cur head like a block and a snub nose why didn't you get a good dog while you were about it dad 
at this expression of opinion the old man burst into such irrepressible and prolonged laughter that the young persons were alarmed hank's wildly rolling eyes tried in vain to become normal and he endeavored to check his father's mirth never mind dad he said soothingly i guess he's all right if you want a pup you shall have a pup we'll bring him up for you he thinks i've gone crazy muttered the old man sinking into his chair and wiping his eyes with his colored handkerchief lack a daisy i never knew what a simpleton hank was doesn't know a thousand dollar dog from a mongrel perletta seeing that hank the only person in the house for whom she stood in awe was fully occupied with his father bent over the pup and exclaimed he favors a cow we used to have old brindle we called her she had a white streak down her nose too ain't he cute and she held out a hand to the dog he turned his little dark face up to her there was something elfish and wicked in his hard brown eyes and before she knew what he was about he had given her a good sharp bite ow ow she ejaculated his teeth be like needles and he be so weeny too gramp turned round keep your fingers away if you don't want to get bitten hank opened the door of the kitchen staircase and put his foot on the lowest step the old man in his second childhood he muttered i expect we'll have some fun with him that pup's going to rule the house i've noticed a change in poor dad the last few days he turned plumb round used to be so ugly and now he's pleasant used to sit with his mouth shut and now he opens it and talks he's going to drop off soon i fear and hank hung his head in real concern as he went to his bedroom to change his street clothes for old ones down in the kitchen grandpa was saying to tilda jane give puff food young things eat often what shall i give him sir the little girl asked ecstatically grandpa began to speak then he hedged he really knew no more than the upbringing of dogs than of elephants give the usual thing he said grandly and plenty of it that will be bread and milk i suppose with a little sugar replied tilda jane put some water in the milk interposed perletta hot water to warm it i've heard say cow's milk ain't too strong for pups but owing to the change from mother's milk you water it that's common sense said grandpa critically now don't scrimp him he added as tilda jane put down a bowl full of supper for the puppy don't scrimp him drawled perletta aggravatedly and with her usual lack of respect by the time your pup gets round that bowl full his sides will stick out like a barrel and he'll likely have a conniption fit take half away take half away cried grandpa and he surveyed in alarm the plump little creature who stood with legs braced far apart and brindled head in the bowl the pup bit tilda jane and protested vigorously but grandpa was inexorable and waved half the contents of the bowl away put it out of his sight girl put it out of his sight don't tantalize the creature tilda jane threw him a wandering glance what had come over grandpa poacher and gippy might stuff themselves to death before his eyes and he would not show a sign of emotion truly this pup had wrought a wonderful change in the old man grandpa she said coaxingly who was the friend that gave you this little dog a good friend replied grandpa promptly and with a look that was a command to ask no further questions don't let him go under the stove with those cannibals he suddenly shouted in great excitement they'll gobble him up give him to me poacher and gippy would not hurt him grandpa remarked tilda jane reproachfully as she put the pup on the old man's knee big dogs don't hurt tiny pups they just look silly at them he won't set on them bare knees said perletta slowly he ain't comfy he wants a chair to his own self get him one said grandpa one with a cushion and sides so he can't fall out there isn't one here said tilda jane looking about there isn't one short of the parlor remarked perletta there's a red plush there that would be fine for a dog tilda jane gave her a rebuking glance but grandpa at once fell in with her suggestion get it he said with a wave of his hand and quickly he's biting my knee bones perletta went in a lumbering way to the parlor and came back again proudly breaking aloft a big fiery red plush armchair that had been brought to enliven its somber haircloth companions put an old blanket on it said grandpa and cover him up his teeth are wicked it's main hot to cover him sir said perletta ingratiatingly i'll fold the blanket and let him set on it like a little man all right said grandpa 
tilda jane gave the pup an affectionate glance and the chair a disapproving one she adored dogs but she did not believe in letting them rule the household perletta on the contrary had a strong unreasoning love for animals and treated them as foolish mothers treat their spoiled offspring now we had better get the supper said tilda jane to perletta mr hank will soon be coming down you set the table and i'll fry the sausages the big girl and the little girl bustled about the kitchen and dining-room and grandpa with a red face sat in the chair one protecting arm thrown round his troublesome pet the pup wriggled and squirmed and finally being on the point of falling caused grandpa to cry in alarm the smell of meat is driving him crazy give him a bit what cried tilda jane and perletta in unison meat for a pup grandpa quailed he's a fighter i guess he said weakly but just as you think i wouldn't hurt him he's only a baby grandpa said tilda jane you don't give babies meat here let me take him so good doggie lie down and go seepy he wants to play does he well tilda will play with him and going to a drawer she took out a piece of soft cotton cloth and began to draw it over the kitchen floor the pup was in ecstasy bracing his tiny paws he growled and hung on and allowed himself to be swung to and fro until grandpa exclaimed wonderingly he's a hold fast and a gripper seems well and strong too hope he'll keep so the poor old man's face was puckered with anxiety ever since tilda jane came he had had no cares no troubles except the ones of years standing lately providentially removed now he had something to think about from the very bottom of his heart he wished to raise this dog for mr waysmith it would be a slight return to make for his kindness to him and yet i don't know about it being slight muttered grandpa wiping the perspiration from his face judging by the way it's begun twill be a sore task how soon do pups grow up hank he asked addressing his son who at the moment entered the kitchen and stood gazing in surprised disapproval at the red plush chair that chair i slaved to get money for the young man was saying under his breath made into a hack for a cur oh i don't know father he said aloud i guess a dog is well grown at a year though i once heard a dog fancier say that most dogs don't get to the pink of perfection till they are three years old grandpa groaned and hank said keenly does it seem long to wait no certainly not none too long pups should have time to grow just like boys yes sir remarked the young man resignedly then he added supper's ready i suppose a new addition to the family will go into the dining room with us of course he will said grandpa taking his suggestion literally and the semi-disgusted hank had the pleasure of lifting the pup and his red flush throne in beside grandpa's seat i'd not leave him out here with her said grandpa with a dissatisfied nod in the direction of perletta who had gone into the wood-house she's got too little sense tilda jane thought this rather ungrateful in grandpa when he had so recently been adopting perletta's suggestions with regards to the pup however she said nothing and generously reflected that it was such a blessing to have grandpa interested in some animal that must not mind even if he were a trifle queer the pup fortunately dropped off to sleep while they were at their meal and grandpa had at last looked at him uneasily seems to me he naps a good deal i hope he isn't sick pups always sleep a lot grandpa said tilda jane like babies you know they take nap and romp and eat by spells grandpa looked relieved and as the pup slept the most of the evening he his care for him was only nominal when bedtime came tilda jane said shall i make a little sleeping place beside the other dogs for puppy grandpa stared at her with eyes wide open with alarm oh i can take him upstairs with me she said i'd love to you're young and you want your rest said grandpa put this chair beside my bed and a lunch on the shelf by the bed head for him young things like to eat in the night are you going to take him right in bed with you grandpa asked tilda jane timidly oh no said the man with a slight shiver put this chair close to me though where i can reach out a hand and feel if he's warm the little girl made a convulsive sound in her throat and said excuse me grandpa i want to go out to the woodhouse to get a couple of apples to take upstairs i'll see to puppy when i come in five minutes later hank found her leaning against the apple barrel her handkerchief pressed to her face and happy tears rolling down her cheeks what's the matter young one he said bluntly she lowered her handkerchief hank i'm most dead laughing to think of dear old gramps sleeping with a pup why that little fellow will be in his bed before five minutes are over tilda jane was right hank 
who did not laugh for he really was concerned about his father crept downstairs several times through the night to see how matters were progressing at ten p m he found his father putting up a brave fight to keep the little dog out of his bed and on his plush chair at ten thirty grandpa had succumbed and the pup was lying with his dark mischievous head tucked close to the old man's neck at one a m there were sounds of conflict as hank went cautiously down the staircase the pup waked up and was insisting on having a game of romps with the sleepy old man you won't lie down will you the unfortunate grandpa was exclaiming if i had a stick here i'd beat ye lie down i say lie down we'll play them he said at last in a tone of sheer exhaustion that's all right worry the sheet sick'em good dog tilda jane has nothing to do but sew up for you it's good you're a money dog and can afford it a money dog mused hank as he crawled back to his own bed what does the old man mean end of chapter ten Chapter 11 of Tilda Jane's Orphans. This is a LibriVox recording. All the LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Tilda Jane's Orphans by Marshall Saunders. Chapter 11 it was saturday morning two weeks later and tilda jane and perletta were exceedingly busy with the baking for sunday the little girl went to school every day now and when saturday came she had a particularly occupied time while she and the big girl made pies and cakes grandpa and the pup sat in two chairs side by side the little dog was growing famously and had become as settled in his daily routine as any member of the family he slept on grandpa's bed at his feet the old man had with much difficulty broken him of his tiresome habit of playing in the middle of the night and of waking him by tugging at his white hair in the morning now puppy had his playthings on the bed his rubber doll his beef bones washed clean of all particles of meat and his ball if he woke in the morning before his guardian did he was obliged to play by himself when grandpa got up and began to dress slowly and painfully on account of his lameness a hilarious time came for the pup he would cunningly watch grandpa till his woolen socks were half on his stiff foot then presto away went the sock under the bed in the puppy's mouth come here good dog grandpa would say pleadingly and puppy in return would give an aggravating extremely youthful bark finding that persuasion was of no avail grandpa would seize one of his crutches and strike it sharply on the floor bad dog this always amused the pup excessively that old man had never struck him and never would and seizing the sock with a firmer grip he would dash round and round the room until grandpa's head was dizzy as a last resort grandpa would go to a box on the table lift the cover and take out a morsel of puppy biscuit cunningly holding it in one hand he would endeavor to snatch the sock as puppy came near however in time the clever little dog became such an adept in retaining the sock and obtaining the biscuit that grandpa was obliged to have recourse to other devices every article of clothing was put on under difficulties puppy ran off with his shoes hung on his coat tails gnawed his trouser legs and yet to the amazement of his family grandpa with the utmost patience permitted this gradual deterioration of his wardrobe one of hank's duties was to go down on his hands and knees every night of his life and draw out from under grandpa's bed the various articles secreted there during the day by the mischievous pup his reflections as he did so were often entertaining in the extreme this saturday morning he had obliged to attend to his duty neglected the night before and was just piling the recovered articles on the bed talking to himself as he did so greatly to the amusement of tilda jane and perletta who heard him through the open door there he ejaculated after another sweep under the bed with a broom here comes somebody's thimble all bent on one side like a battered hat you wouldn't think the puppy had so much power in his jaws i miss my silver thimble two days agone cried perletta with a kind of screech one that was gov me you don't mean to say he laid paws on that 
Looks like it, said Hank grimly, and he put in her hand the chewed piece of silver. Hush, girl, exclaimed Grandpa, when she burst into howls of dismay. How much was Grandpa drew out his purse? Here's a dollar, he said grandly. Go buy yourself, too. Perletta's lamentations ceased as suddenly as they had begun, and Hank, with a red face, made another dive under the bed. Seems to me this looks like my turn, he said dryly. Two men's gloves, good dog skin, one thumb chewed off, and three fingers. Now when in the name of common sense did that young sarpent nab those? He ain't allowed upstairs now, is he? No, said Tilda Jane soberly, but the naughty little thing sneaks up whenever our backs are turned. I think Grandpa ought to have a small switch for him. Don't you lay a finger on that dog, said Grandpa hastily, and he put a protecting hand over the wicked little head with his rolling eye sleepily upturned to him. He'll improve when he's older. How much are your gloves worth, Hank? Two dollars, said the young man. Come here, said his father, again taking out his purse. There. Five dollars, said Hank gravely, but with a wink at Tilda Jane. I owe you three dollars, sir, and he bought out his own purse next said hank leaving the kitchen and more going down on one knee by the bed two dark green neckties pretty well masticated i guess there's yours sir let that pass said the old man with a wave of his hand i don't care seems to me puppy's been neglecting you tilda jane remarked hank here's something coming and she cautiously drew the broom toward him my what a mess nutmegs chewed considerable one half-eaten apple a piece of pie why he's setting up a lunch counter under your bed father some rags my new cup towels exclaimed tilda jane in distress torn to ribbons and i only hemmed them night before last a book continued hank with an unmoved face desperation if it ain't my library book i'll be fine for that six leaves gone at the first middle missing and no end and a heap of paper in the southwest corner of the bed valance if this is retail work what will that pup be when he goes into business wholesale grandpa can i get a little switch asked tilda jane pleadingly a nice little switch a tender one just to let him know he can't take everything under your bed i don't want his spirit broken i'll scarcely whip him at all said tilda jane kindly i'll whip the table leg and myself too a little and talk cross to him i can make him cry and whine just as easy and feel he's a bad dog and at last but not least said hank solemnly a great big roll of something in a corner the new gown i bought for you father by all that's filial tassels chewed off and a big v out of the skirt as he spoke he rose and tragically held out the red flowered gown grandpa stared at it and then turned to tilda jane i guess you better get the switch sissy a slender one quite slender but get it it ain't fair to give you so much sewing well i'm off for the mill explained hank rising and brushing off his knee the very first chance i get i'll drive in a lot of hooks round the walls so you can hang things up out of that pup's way if i don't and he keeps on at that rate by the time he's six months old we'll be as destitute of clothes as the go with Adams in central africa now dad mind this is a half holiday being saturday i'm going to keep you all the afternoon in the sunshine it's just the day for a sleigh ride all right said grandpa agreeably and hank hurried from the house grandpa's eyes turned to the puppy he had just dropped off to sleep and in a short time would wake up eat sleep and play that summed up his life he was a terrible care yet grandpa looked at him with certain satisfaction he's getting to enjoy dog company hank often used to say to tilda jane and it shows that no sane person can be happy without responsibility if it's only a pup another cause of gratitude grandpa had in spite of the pup's bad actions was that he had certainly benefited the rheumatism that used to torture the old man especially at night it's the gentle warmth of the dog sleeping on your feet said hank you never did have half enough clothes on you at night and you wouldn't coddle yourself with hot water bottles as some old folks do perletta the ir irrepressible whenever the subject came up had a long string of stories to relate about the person in her part of the country who had been cured of sciatica and rheumatism by sleeping with dogs and cats 
tilda jane tried to listen patiently to her stories for no one else liked the poor girl perletta was undoubtedly peculiar she was rude awkward foolish and forward she went about with a dissatisfied frown on her face except at such times when she indulged in silly good humor or in cunning attempts to draw attention to herself she was terribly jealous of tilda jane who was a general favorite to be an orphan too she used to say gloomily yet tilda jane she gets all the soft words cause she's got sense hank would remark piteously and you haven't well why ain't i got it pears to me i have and then if you were in the humor you would enter upon a long argument on the subject on this particular morning she had kept asking tilda jane if she did not hear a voice in the air calling perletta 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 no said tilda jane soberly i hear nothing but the tea kettle singing there's something calling me three times by spells persisted perletta i wonder what it's a sign of it's a sign that you're not making that apple pear work quite enough said tilda jane i shall have my pie crust ready long before the apples are sliced tilda said grandpa suddenly tilda get me my dog book the little girl reached to a shelf behind her and handed him a handsome volume with a picture of a dog on the cover grandpa opened the book and began to read to himself in a low voice as he often did until a dog is matured he must be a source of anxiety to one who knows the risks during this age of growth and development there are however times of greater danger or critical periods these are when being weaned when getting the permanent teeth and between these two periods chiefly or to be put it otherwise till the puppy is eight or nine months old grandpa sighed and turned over the leaf the most important factor of all in the environment is the individual who undertakes the work of rearing puppies if he lacks intelligence and sympathetic feeling with dogs by which alone they can be comprehended it is idle to hope that any directions will be of avail grandpa reached out a hand and patted the sleeping head nearly eighty and i never knew that before then he continued his reading a litter that with the same general management will grow up to the highest perfection they are capable of under one man will be miserable calls under another who neglects details of adaptation litter exclaimed grandpa breaking off suddenly that means a lot thank fortune i've only got one he gave a slight shudder at the thought of a number of pups equally destructive equally troublesome ranging through his small house tilda jane he said after a few minutes when he was obligated to put his book aside to prevent the roused pup from showing it this dog is getting too much soft food he's got to have more crusts and crackers very well gramps she said agreeably and some meat continued the old man i've just been reading that all puppies after eight weeks require a little meat for the dogs are flesh eaters i'll mince some fine for him at dinner time grandpa and the, the books says thoroughbred dogs should not go in the street before six months of age lest they get distemper from other dogs tilda jane raised her flushed face from the oven door that she was just closing on the completed pies that's so grandpa but i guess it doesn't matter for curs like your dog and mine that doesn't sound like you sissy he said severely ain't curs as good as race dogs oh yes sir i didn't mean that she said anxiously i just meant i don't want to keep the curs from having fun i think that pup ought to go out some of these sunny days i mean for walks of course i've always exercised him in the yard he wants something more now he's growing so fast but he's got a cold in his throat said grandpa he rattles in his sleep i hope he don't keep you awake said the little girl never mind about me replied grandpa hastily talk about the dog i was figuring that if the creature went with his bare feet in the snow and ice it would give him more cold that dog wants onion sass interposed perletta suddenly onion stewed with lemon juice dropped in after that'll cure the rattling grandpa's face was quite concerned i gave him some sweet oil she added he gobbles it right up but the book says you mustn't dose puppies too much he'll get stronger as he gets older said tilda jane consolingly nobody could take better care of him than you do grandpa for you never let him get too hot or too cold and he is scarcely out of your sight which is the right way to raise good dogs and good babies you got to watch the little creatures that's reasonable said grandpa and now 
about this going out how would driving do just the thing said tilda jane clapping her hands you could wrap him all up but his cunning little head make him a little coat said grandpa make it right away i did think of making a pudding for dinner said tilda jane but let the pudding go let it go we'll eat bread and butter said grandpa where's your cloth get her work basket perletta i think perletta had better go on stoning those raisins said tilda jane i can imagine the coat by myself grandpa was always in a great hurry where the pup was concerned glanced at the clock it's ten already soon it will be eleven and then we're close on dinner time you'd better make haste you can run the thing up on the sewing machine hank brought i want the dog to wear it this afternoon tilda jane got a roll of black broadcloth that had been left from grandpa's new sunday suit now she said we must fit doggy you hold him up grandpa end of chapter eleven Chapter Twelve of Tilda Jane's Orphans. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Brandon. Tilda Jane's Orphans by Marshall Saunders. Chapter Twelve, Grandpa's Drive. The old man took hold of the soft, wriggling creature beside him and tried to balance him on his knees in vain puppy doubled his legs under him opened his mouth bit at everything within reach turned and twisted till grandpa in perplexity called out he's all gristle i don't believe there's a bone in his body get a table or something to prop him on perletta only too happy to leave her work to fuss with animals propelled herself leisurely into the front of the house and brought out a little table from the parlor grandpa put the puppy on it and perletta held his legs while tilda jane with scissors and paper cut out a pattern of a little coat make it come well over his chest said grandpa remember his weak throat he won't stand up sir said tilda jane anxiously he's made up his mind to lie down i never seed a pup so sot in his ways remarked perletta solemnly in a few minutes they were all exhausted the two girls had fallen into helpless laughter at the pup's antics grandpa only was grim and determined and spurred on by him tilda jane at last controlled herself sufficiently to cut out something that had the semblance of a coat now lay it on the cloth exclaimed grandpa releasing the little creature who spun round and round the kitchen like a top cut it out large and generous it's too black he said when tilda jane at last held up the tiny garment looks as if he was in mourning put on something bright some red braid would be real cute said tilda jane but we haven't any in the house go downtown said grandpa buy plenty don't cut him short tilda jane glanced at the clock then at the big kitchen table littered with preparations for more cooking saturday morning's a busy time she said grandpa began to dance one of his crutches up and down on the floor a sign of great mental disturbance do you want that pup to die i tell you he can't go to drive with his chest uncovered tilda jane glanced at him anxiously then she said grandpa dear don't you worry i'll start right off and after a few hurried directions to perletta she scurried down the street in the direction of the shops by dinner time the coat was stitched trimmed and buttoned on the pup and as hank came in the front door the final trying on was in process he burst into a great guffaw of laughter hey doggy you look like a king the pup all was excited by hank's good-natured jovial voice made a bound broke from his attendants and dashed round and round the kitchen under the stove the table and chairs his eyes wild and wicked his wide mouth open his pink tongue hanging hank gave a loud whoop every time he passed him hi little demon go it hurrah for the black and red catch him catch him called grandpa in distress he'll roast alive in that thick coat in this hot kitchen he'll have a coughing spell that's so shouted hank agreeably 
don't fret we'll corner him tilda jane look out for that hurdle there perletta stand by the stone wall and he indicated the old-fashioned fireplace where the stove sat after many false dives and swoopings after the nimble little fellow and after perletta had broken two plates and a pitcher in her wild plunges puppy was secured his coat unbuttoned and he laid panting and exhausted across grandpa's knees some cold water for him commanded the old man he's hot he's on fire hold on a bit father said hank consolingly he'll cool down play has to go on in the world and pups and children and other young creatures are made to carry on that very thing you keep your eye off him replied grandpa decidedly you put the mischief in him your slave sir said hank obediently and during dinner time he did not once glance at the still mischievous animal who in vain tried to attract his attention now sir said hank when the dinner was over all on board for the sleigh ride yes yes said grandpa getting up from his chair tilda jane come put on my snow boots yes grandpa i'm just warming them under the stove said the little girl and here's your big overcoat i brought it in from the front hall to take the chill off twenty minutes later the beautiful milkweed stood by the back door thoughtfully pawing the snow with one slender hoof while tilda jane and perletta assisted grandpa into the sleigh tuck the hot water can under his feet perletta said tilda jane and give me that hot water bag please what's that what's that asked grandpa suspiciously as the little girl thrust something soft on his knees i ain't a woman i shan't carry a muff i've seen a picture of the emperor of germany carrying a muff when he was going hunting said hank and i guess tilda jane thinks you're getting so tony now with a horse and a dog and new clothes that you'll want to shine up to his germanship it isn't a muff grandpa said tilda jane soothingly it's a hot water bag wrapped in a shawl what does the girl take me for asked grandpa in pretentious discontent i ain't as old and feeble as she thinks no grandpa but we don't want you to get so besides the hot bag will be just the thing for the pup see how he curls up on it you may leave it then said the old man i'm much obliged get out yourself tilda have a walk yes sir yes sir and she waved her hand as hank clucked to milkweed and they went gaily out of the yard and down the street with sleigh bells dancing and ringing perletta she said as they turned to enter the house it's a lovely day would you like to go out i ain't got no one to go with said perletta in a glum voice you may go with me said tilda jane kindly i have some shopping to do downtown will you take me to the moving pictures asked the disagreeable girl as if she were conferring a favor on tilda jane by accepting her offer yes if i have time we must clear up here first grandpa and hank were driving down french row i guess we'll go out in the country said hank the snow is just about right depth go downtown said grandpa i want you to buy something for me downtown said hank disconsolately then he added cheerfully all right sir what do you want a hall stove a hall stove repeated hank and he stared at his father and then dropped his eyes to the wide-awake pup who with just his young head peering from the fur was greedily drinking in the scenery on this his first drive i bet it's for that pup he said under his breath that moneyed pup his father heard him partly for the pup hank he said mildly partly for the little girl the house is cold and i've got a little extra money i thought i'd spend it we've always got on without one said hank Pears to me we're snug enough a fire in the kitchen all day one in the dining room evenings grandpa did not bear opposition well you're a great fat lout he said with some heat i'm old and my blood is thin tilda jane ain't strong and the pup is sappy and has a rattlin in his throat laughed hank go ahead dad just as you say i'll buy two hall stoves if you like one for upstairs one for down and as he spoke he turned milkweed's head 
toward the center of the town. I guess you and Sissy and the pup are worth a stove. I know I don't feel the cold, but I ain't selfish. After they had dashed through one snowy street after another, and had brought up with a flourish in front of Siskasset's leading stove store, Hank turned to his father. Now, sir, what kind of a heating machine do you want? Give me the lines, said Grandpa, bringing his hands quite warm, thanks to Tilda Jane's hot water bag from beneath the fur rug. Go into the store, buy a stove, I don't care what kind. Have it put up, I'll pay for it. You've struck a gold mine, sure, said Hank, with a chuckle. However, I'll make him give me a good discount off for cash, he added as his father handed him a roll of bills. And I'll not bother you about choosing it. Don't chafe if I stay a spell. Milkweed will stand like a lady unless someone throws a bomb at her. That ain't likely to happen here, said Grandpa. Still it might. I'll keep a grip of the lines. A good driver never lets them go, no matter if his animal is perfection. Hank chuckled again, and pushing his cap a little on one side, went into the store feeling quite important as he always did now in his new role of a family man better than being a lonely old coot a chasin himself about the country he said under his breath while grandpa sat in the sleigh trying to straighten his old back and hold his head up being quite well aware of the fine appearance he presented in his good coat his warm fur cap to say nothing of the handsome sleigh and the graceful milkweed his eyes lighted on someone driving swiftly down the street siskasset was fortunate in having a very wide main street on each side were stores that were unusually fine for a small town where persons were hurriedly passing in and out intent on their saturday shopping the middle of the street was as lively as the sidewalks but among all the driving sleighs and delivery sleighs and big teams from the country grandpa's eye rested on the smart dark blue cutter where a man sat alone handling his reins in a masterly fashion as if hypnotized by the old man's admiring eye the occupant of the cutter pulled up when he got near him and guided his horse close beside milkweed and then a trifle past her, so that he could talk comfortably with Grandpa. "'Good day, sir,' said the old man stiffly, but agreeably. "'I am glad to see you out,' said Mr. Waysmith, and he gave one comprehensive glance over the horse, the sleigh, and the neatly dressed old man. "'There's one thing, sir, you don't see,' said Grandpa proudly, and he lifted the fur cover on his knee. Mr. Waysmith's face lighted up strangely, and Grandpa lifted out the warm and cozy puppy. He's got to sleep, sir. Gets tired easy. Youth and old age are alike in that respect. Let me see him, please, said the merchant. And reaching over, he transferred the puppy to his own knees. The little dog, still in the first blush of youth, and having puppy confidence in all the world, woke up at this treatment and finding himself in the hands of a stranger fell into an ecstasy and began to lick his gloves and any part of his face that his pink tongue could reach you'll get over that when you're older said mr waysmith under his breath you will be like your father muffles and only recognize your friends keep still wriggler he said aloud i want to look at you and slipping off the new coat he carefully examined him head chest back and legs he's a beauty he said in a low utterly contented voice points almost perfect how is his health good except his throat said grandpa that's weak better put on his coat sir see he's beginning to cough that weakness will likely pass away said mr waysmith in a tone of deep satisfaction the first few weeks are the ticklish ones with this breed. I hope he's not a great trouble to you. Well, said Grandpa, after a slight hesitation, he's a perfect gentleman, if you let him have his own way. Not very different in that respect 
from human beings said mr waysmith and though he addressed grandpa his eyes remained fixed on the small animal his passion for dogs was so profound that he could not conceal his intense interest in them and in this little fellow in particular and grandpa shrewd enough to perceive this and being also extremely anxious to let mr waysmith know that he was trying to make some return for his favors to him said he's a great pet sir we've no child in our home he most fills the place does he said mr waysmith in tones of great gratification i hope the little girl does not find him too much care no sir she sets great store by him and never gets out of patience he destroys things i suppose well sir i may say he does by times no need to show up all that goes on in your house remarked grandpa stoutly and he tried to forget the chewed off corner of the red plush chair and a ripped up silk umbrella that he had noticed just before he left home what do you want us to call him sir he went on he's quite a dog ought to have a name i have not yet settled on a name for him said mr waysmith i will let you know later hank's been reading an irish story to me evenings said grandpa and in my mind i call this fellow after the hero handy andy the wild irishman later in life lord scatterbrain mr waysmith smiled so hank reads samuel lover's stories does he rory o'more is another i dare say it would be a good plan to start this family of dogs with irish names we will call this little chap handy andy then andy for short very good sir and grandpa tucked the shivering pup nearer the hot water bag you got my check dilson asked mr waysmith yes sir it's far too much the pup don't cost near that much don't send any more till i ask for it mr waysmith smiled peculiarly and touched his horse lightly with the whip good-bye dilson he don't like to be dictated to muttered grandpa best to let him alone what he sends will in time make up a snug sum for the little girl if it hadn't been for her i'd not be sitting here for hank would not have come home she's done it all but we mustn't spoil her where's that boy of mine and he glanced through the big glass windows where stoves of all sizes exhibited themselves in stolid rows to the gaze of the passers-by hank who had struck a good bargain some time ago had been dodging about behind the stoves waiting for mr waysmith to go away all very well for him and father to eat off the same plate he said if i stick my spoon in i'll get a rap over the knuckles father's an old man and i'm young and mr waysmith's understrapper hands off no familiarity etc etc well dad he went on drawing on his thick fur gloves as he sauntered out to the sleigh i guess you had a caller his father handed him the reins without a word did he take much stock in the pup asked hank mischievously the moneyed pup he added under his breath still his father did not speak and he continued mr waysmith don't make much of dogs by all outward signs that bulldog of his follows him about with a tired don't care waddle if mr waysmith stops short dog goes and lies down way off and stares in the other direction as if he don't belong to him but he knows what goes on better than if he was by his side and i'm kind of suspicious of that friendship mr waysmith is a great man to pretend he's awful hard and flinty and he ain't i believe he likes dogs grandpa apparently had no opinion on the subject for he resolutely kept his mouth shut and hank threw a waggish wink in the direction of the pup who at this instant stuck his moist young nose from under the rug then seeing that no information was to be extracted from his father he turned his attention to milkweed and politely requested her to go up kennebago street instead of going home as she wished to do i wish i loved business the way you love your stable hank said to her and milkweed being a horse of a sociable and reasonable disposition turned her head as if she really understood what he said why shouldn't a fellow talk to his horse her master often said there's more pleasure and profit in conversing with them 
than with some human beings and it's a lot safer who ever heard of a horse giving away a secret grandpa remained sunk in his reverie so hank who was at almost all times a fluent and continuous talker kept on favoring milkweed with sundry observations on the persons and turnouts they met they were now getting toward the residence part of ciscasset in common with many other places the stores were gradually advancing eating up fine houses and gardens and forcing the lovers of quiet and extensive grounds to move further and further from the center of commerce just where houses began to alternate with stores hank exclaimed suddenly why there's tilda jane and perletta and poacher and gippy all sky-gazing except gippy grandpa stared and saw that the other members of his family were indeed apparently gazing up into the sky hank pulled milkweed up near the sidewalk well sissy do you see an airship or has perletta's last bit of common sense gone sailing into the blue tilda jane turned round with a start oh hank is it you we're listening to the pigeons there's a young one there being fed see him follow his parents and shake his wings hank drew his cap over his eyes and looked at the top of the tall house near them sure enough he said there is a young one there spring is coming but it's powerful early for street pigeons to be making nests they must be well fed what is it asked grandpa i'm a bit snow blind from the glare it's three sooty-looking pigeons said hank two old one young and the young one is following the old one round that flat roof flapping his big wings and yelling for his supper he's most the size of his parents but he can't feed himself listen to his voice how callow it is there he's getting something no he isn't he's in such a hurry that he stepped over the edge of the roof and now he's flying across the street to the opposite houses you can see him now yes grandpa could and did see him he's like a cow he said not quite so black dad bless me he's off that roof now i vow this is his first flight he goes in a wobbly fashion so so steady and he spoke soothingly to milkweed who to her surprise suddenly found a black bird dashing by her head he's astonished himself as well as you milkweed said hank as the dark pigeon went precipitately fluttering over the snowy road and on to the sidewalk pussy willows and grimalkins tilda jane has turned a cat in the pan hank had burst into a sonorous peal of laughter and grandpa who saw nothing amusing fell into a nervous fit of irritability hush up he exclaimed you sound like a foghorn what's the matter anyway you're so big i can't see a past you sir said hank clapping one broad hand over his mouth to check his laughter i just saw two cats and one was sissy grandpa turned his head away sulkily truly sir said hank tilda did make a leap in the air you know though usually she ain't a rusher she can be quick as a flash when the times call for lightning that black pigeon was kiting over the snow and got under that yard fence a gray cat who was sneaking the deer only knows where sprang on it like a tiger tilda couldn't get over the fence but she gave a leap in the air and hurled her shopping bag in the cat's face pussy ran you may be sure with poacher after her then the dog came back crawled under the fence seized the day's bird in his mouth and carried it to tilda who now has it pressed to the breast of that warm brown coat you gave her sissy come here he said raising his voice the little girl turned and holding the pigeon firmly walked toward the sleigh let's see your windfall said hank i guess it's all right only frightened but it can't fly straight shouldn't have left the roof for all who flutter their wings and fly a hawk is hovering in the sky only in this case it was a cat what shall i do with it asked tilda jane anxiously could we get it to the top of that high building and if we did would it stay there law no said hank it would likely blunder down again and pussy would get it let me feel it it's a pretty fat squab or squeaker now that it's left the nest turn your head and i'll wring its neck and take it home twill make a tasty pie for father's sunday dinner 
tilda jane seized the pigeon and shrank away from him in dismay what you want to keep it said hank well i'll not snatch it anything to oblige a good little girl like you cuddle it right up to you and when i get home i'll show you how to feed it but he added teasingly don't let perletta get it in her clutches she looks as if she would like to eat something alive and with a final chuckle he drove swiftly up the street what's the matter with perletta asked grandpa curiously when i spoke of killing the pigeon her eyes flashed and she doubled up her big fists as if she would smite me to the earth the snowy earth didn't you hear her muttering to herself she's half simpleton but she's good to animals tilda jane was trotting rapidly along the street in the opposite direction holding the trembling bird inside her warm coat while she muttered tenderly poor little housetop you shan't be eaten i will be a mother to you End of chapter 12 recording by john brandon chapter 13 of tilda jane's orphans this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org tilda jane's orphans by marshall saunders chapter 13 little housetop now as to pigeon said hank a few hours later in a pompous and comfortable voice tilda jane do you know anything about them i know they like to be fed regularly said the little girl reproachfully hank gave an unctuous giggle ho ho mrs huffy because i would have my own supper before i attended to pidgeys birds and animals have to watch while their masters feed but do they like it she asked keenly hank shrugged his shoulders not more than we do i expect but you know tilda half the world has to wait while the other half feeds and sometimes they starve while they're waiting it isn't right she said decidedly the lord made enough to go round now you're trying to draw me into a discussion and i ain't going to be drawn said hank and he spread his arms out on the dining-room table and gazed good-naturedly about him and then particularly at the pigeon who was sitting stolidly in a basket tilda jane get me first a newspaper the little girl handed him one and he spread it carefully over the red tablecloth now cut me a slice of fresh bread and bring it to me on a plate with some boiling water and a kettle you ain't going to feed that bird boiling water called Paletta from the doorway where she stood wiping a plate on a towel in a slow and dawdling manner not while i'm alive and fighting especially fighting returned hank oh ain't she a peach and he shook with suppressed laughter until slow tears formed and rolled down his cheeks tilda he said when he recovered himself have the water fiery a slow boil won't do it must be a jumping one hush Paletta said tilda jane as she passed her on her way to the kitchen mr hank wouldn't hurt that bird he's only twitting you he doesn't hurt it grumbled Paletta, still keeping a wary eye on the mischievous young man i'd not trust him alone with no bird nor purr he's all right with horses now little tilda remarked hank when she came back what do you think i'm going to make i don't know hank she said well get me a saucer full of rolled oats the kind you use for mush and you'll see tilda jane ran to the pantry and when she came back found Paletta in a state of desperation alternately advancing into the dining room and retreating to the kitchen for hank sat with the little brass water kettle uplifted as if he were going to pour some of its contents down the pigeon's throat hank exclaimed tilda jane rebukingly and becoming sober he said now sissy watch because you'll have to do it yourself next time see i pour some water on the slice of bread enough to soften it then i put on rolled oats and mash them together in a sticky mess then i knead it with my hand look just as if i was making bread in the old-fashioned way go get me a few grains of rice to put in now i'm going to make pills from this dough and your little lean paws will be better at that than my big ones take notice this way not round pills long ones tilda jane eagerly manipulated her part of the dough and made several well-shaped of long morsels that's fine said hank now get me a shawl for pidgey a shawl repeated tilda jane in surprise yes a cloth anything to go over his shoulders it's pretty warm here she said surveying the glowing fire in the stove near them hank laughed it isn't for heat sissy do you suppose that pigeon's going to stand still and let us feed him no sir he would for his father but not for us Paletta, give me that dish clout glad of an excuse to come into the room Paletta handed him her towel and folding it neatly shawlwise hank bound it about the wings of the pigeon then addressed tilda jane open his beak sissy not too far don't throw his head back let him stand in a natural position now dip the pill in water and slip it gently back in his beak he will take charge of its going down his throat well well said tilda jane thoughtfully i never knew that was the way to feed pigeons i'd have tried it with a spoon there's another way said hank of letting him feed through your fingers you know old pigeons feed their young ones by pumping the food down their throats yes i've seen them out on the barn roof said tilda jane you spread your fingers apart continued hank and the squab will often help you by gobbling down what you put in his beak but this fellow's pretty old i guess pills are better a pity he isn't younger if you want to keep him 
Why? Won't he get tame? asked Tilda Jane. Not as tame as if you'd had him as soon as his eyes were opened. How did you know so much about pigeons? asked the little girl wonderingly. I once travelled along with a show of them, and I learned a lot. I didn't know you ever belonged to any show but the creamery business, said Tilda Jane, opening her black eyes wide at him. I didn't, sissy. I just happened to be going from place to place at the same time as this vaudeville affair. There was a man connected with it that had tame pigeons, and whenever he exhibited them, he brought down the house. They were as tame as kittens and did tricks for him, and followed him wherever he went. How did he make them like him? asked Tilda Jane. That was his secret, sissy. He wouldn't tell anyone, for he said if he did, everyone would be going into the pigeon trick business. But I found out, and a simple enough thing it was. What was it? she inquired eagerly. I said to him one day, Smith, I believe your whole trick is to get those fellows when they're young. And he told me at once. He went to pigeon lofts and chose the birds he wanted, and took them out of the nest before their eyes were open. He brought them up by hand, and they always thought he was their father. Even after they learned to feed themselves? Yes, sissy. He always stood by them, whereas you know an ordinary pigeon throws off one brace of young ones to raise another. The pigeon stood by him too, and it was cute to see them light all over him, and rub his face with their beaks, and look in his pockets for seeds. What did he give them to eat? All sorts of grains and seeds. Pigeons don't eat much green stuff, unless they're obliged to. He was as fussy about their diet as you are about Dad's. Nothing was too good for them, and why shouldn't he have looked after them? They brought him in a nice, tidy income. Pigeons are dear birds, said Tilda Jane thoughtfully, so big and plump. I'm always afraid to handle little birds. And they're smart, said Hank. Why, a homing pigeon is as knowing as a dog. Look out there, Tilda. Handy Andy is crawling off of father's knee to get those pills. Naughty boy, said Tilda Jane, tapping the mischievous brindled paws. Stealing from a poor orphan pidgey. Grandpa, who had first watched the feeding of the pigeon with interest, had fallen asleep. Hank gently took the pup from him and carried him out to the kitchen, where he soon had the little creature engaged in a game of ball. Tilda restored the pigeon to its basket and, lavishing all sorts of blandishments on it, tried in vain to win its confidence. The pigeon sat coldly and timidly staring at her. "'No use, sissy,' said Hank presently from the doorway. "'Wait till after you've fed it a few days.' Tilda Jane perforce had to wait, but day by day the pigeon thought. He could not resist the affectionate attention bestowed on him, and at the end of a week he would utter hoarse appealing cries and shake his wings whenever he saw his little owner approaching him. "'I just love little housetop,' Tilda Jane said enthusiastically. "'But don't be jealous, dogs,' she went on, addressing Poacher and Gibby, who sat dumbly eloquent before her. "'This birdie, slipping into a tiny corner of my heart, won't crowd you two dogs, nor the puppy,' she added, as Handy Andy came dancing into the kitchen, his pink tongue out, his wicked eyes looking for mischief. Poacher and Gippy were sensible enough not to interfere with the pigeon. Not so the wild Irish pup Lord Scatterbrain. He sprang at it whenever he saw it, caught its tail feathers between his teeth, forcing Tilda Jane to keep it mostly upstairs where puppy was not supposed to go. On this particular evening, the pigeon, who spent a good deal of his time sitting on her shoulder, had descended to the kitchen on this his favourite perch. Tilda Jane was just about to go to bed. Hank had retired, and Pauletta was tidy in the kitchen, preparatory to ascending to her little room. Tilda Jane watched her as she went to and fro, picking up the pup's toys and pushing the chairs back in their places, straightening things on the shelves and raising the window curtains so that the room would be light when they descended in the morning. "'She isn't slack, though she is unhandy,' said the little girl to herself. "'Perhaps I ought to tell her. A pat on the back makes the heart light. Paletta, she said aloud, "'you're getting to be quite a housekeeper.' Paletta, who was winding the clock, gave her a peculiar look. "'You're glad you came here, aren't you?' continued Tilda Jane. "'It's better than the asylum, isn't it?' "'Better in some ways, worse in others,' the big girl said ungraciously. "'Would you like to go back to the asylum?' asked Tilda Jane. "'No,' blurted the other. "'Back to the asylum? No.' "'Would you like another place?' inquired Tilda Jane. "'We could get you one if we tried. I know you're not happy here.' "'A place? I want a home,' Paletta burst forth wrathfully. "'Ain't I worth it?' "'It's a pity you can't settle down here,' said the little girl with a trace of irritation in her tone. "'Sometimes you act as if we were all against you.' Paletta was talking to herself as she often did. This suited her better than giving a direct answer. Some folks get all the petting. Oh, sweetie, dearie, how spruce you be. Cute little girlie, she run away, did she, from the wicked asylum. She wanted a happy home. Oh, my. And Paletta threw back her big head and laughed hysterically. Paletta was having one of her queer fits, and the better way round it would be to leave her. But Tilda Jane, in spite of her two years of peace and plenty, was by no means a model young girl yet. You're all wrong inside, she said hastily. The fault isn't with us, tis with yourself. Paletta stared at her angrily, and at this instant Hank, most unfortunately, made his appearance in the stairway, a tumbler in his hand. He was in his shirt sleeves and had been reading in his room until he became thirsty and had descended for a glass of water. What's going on? he asked, eyeing the two excited girls. Paletta, you look mad enough to bite the stove in two. And she looks mad as a wet hen, cried the big girl, pointing an accusing finger at Tilda Jane. Tis true, said Hank meditatively. 
but I bet it's your fault. From Maine to Texas, there couldn't be a woman such a master hand at riling as you. Now you just go to bed and leave Sissy alone. Pauletta drew in her breath. Then, to borrow her own expression, she began to call Hank all the abusive names she could lay her tongue to. At first he was furious and Tilda Jane fell into despair at having precipitated a quarrel between the two persons who usually confine themselves to brief personalities. Pauletta for once had lost all fear of Hank, but she soon spoilt the effect of her words by using such peculiar phraseology that Hank from rage passed to amusement, then to ridicule. "'What's that you say?' he ejaculated suddenly. "'I'm womble-cropped. What in creation is that?' "'I thought I'd heard fellows laying for each other, but upon my word you outsyllable any jockey I ever listened to. Where did you get those sweet names, Stormy Head? Hold on, I'll make a list.' And he pretended to be fumbling in his pocket for pencil and paper." Pauletta, in an overpowering, speechless rage, poured the air wildly with her two big hands. Then she rushed from the room and Tilda Jane, after a few inarticulate remarks, followed her example. "'Field's clear. I can make for the water faucet,' said Hank philosophically. "'It's lucky I dropped on him when I did, or Big Girl would likely have had little girl's hair all thawed out. Big Girl had better leave. She's too hippopotamusy for us.' Tilda Jane, panting breathlessly, had rushed to her room, and pulling aside the curtain at the window, was gazing out at the starlit night. Oh dear, she gasped. I'm all tuckered out and it's my own fault. Temper marched on ahead and I trotted behind. Why didn't I let Pauletta alone? She paused and throwing up her window turned first one hot cheek and then the other to the cool night breeze. How many times in her careworn life had she gone to her window at night and gazed out on a sleeping world? She did not know, poor partially educated girl, that she had one thing in common with the best and greatest of the earth. Dear Mother Nature could always pour balm on her wounds. Weak and frail as she was, she had a great heart, and presently she felt calm and soothed by the beneficent influence of the night. "'Seems as if I lose Pauletta when I look up at the stars,' she said in an awed voice as she raised her little dark face in the magnificence of the sky. "'They're so awful quiet. Teacher tells me there are other worlds. Maybe there are other Palettas in them. Oh, Lord, I'm only a little girl, and I live in a little place, and I shouldn't make too much of myself, but still I'm somebody. I must do better by Pauletta, and try to be more loving, because she craves affection. I'll try to pretend she's pretty, and has got big blue eyes and curly hair. I wish she wasn't so ugly inside and out, but she can't help it. Lord bless all the world, because Sisakat is only a small bit of it. Make it nicer for the people and the birds and the animals, and don't let folks suffer too much. Kill them quick, O oh Lord, because it's the pain that counts. She fell into a sudden and long silence until a faint musical faraway sound reached her ear. It's Jean Melancon, she said, coming home singing, and her black eyes tried to pierce the darkness of the night in the direction of the singer. Soon the soft wind blowing up the river brought her the words. May God preserve thee, Canada, though child among the nations, mid proudest lands, strongest hearts and hands, shall claim for thee a station, land of the forest and the lake, land of the rushing river. Our prayers shall rise for thy dear sake forever and forever. It's just what I said, she murmured, when the sweet boyish voice was still. There are other nations. Those French people don't forget their own land, and God loves us all, French people and Americans and English and all the world. If only we could be better. She sighed and gave a long last look at the sky, the quiet garden and the road. She could not see the river, but she felt the soft wind blowing from it and whispering, the spring is coming, maybe Pauletta will be happier when she can get outdoors more. She drew the curtain and began to get ready for bed. It seems as if we might all be happy, she soliloquized, as she folded her garments neatly and laid them across a chair. Grandpa is, he's lying in that room downstairs, warm and cosy with that frisky pup like a baby at his feet. He's quiet in his mind now, and Hank is cheery as the day is long. His health is good, and he stands well with the folks here. I'm happy because I've got dear old Gippy, and that sweet and lovely poacher, and this cute little housetop. And approaching the pigeon, she allowed him to rub her cheek affectionately with his beak. And out in the barn, she continued his milkweed munching on her good sound oats and hay, and Ruth Ann the cow chewing her cud, and the hens next door with their scaly legs all well, and their crops sticking out with good things, and the pigeons and sparrows gone to sleep in the nice warm winter houses Hank put up on the side of the barn for them. And we've got a hall stove, and all the house is like summer, and I can sit upstairs and sew a spell when I want to be alone with housetop. Only Pauletta is ugly, and is it our fault or isn't it? Hank says it isn't that she just has a chip on her shoulder and no one will ever get it away from her. Poor Pauletta, she frets me. Maybe her badness is more my fault than I think, and with a disturbed face the little girl mechanically stroked her bird. She thought afterwards with a pang at her heart how especially dear her little pigeon seemed to her that night. He had grown considerably since she got him, and surveying his little plump body with pride, she went to her closet and took out some of the choice oily hemp seed that Hank had got her as a treat for him. 
little housetop making a low murmuring sound of gratitude greedily swallowed the seeds as tilda jane put them in his beak and fluttered his wings for more no no she said gently but you may have a drink of water and she took the mug from her washstand and held it out to him he had learned to drink by this time though he could not yet eat and dipping his beak he drank long and heartily and then flew to the big cracker box filled with straw that hank had got for him even after getting into bed it seemed as if tilda jane could not get her bird out of her mind and once she sprang up and moved his box away from the window dear pidgey if you took cold while i was warm in bed i would never forgive myself she said to him sleep warm little brother the bird uttered a gracious coo he had become so fond of her that he would respond to her call any time of the day or night tilda jane soon fell asleep bad dreams disturbed her she felt that she had done wrong in yielding to a fit of impatience and this knowledge pursued her though she slept soundly enough not to hear a heavy stealthy footstep in her room an hour later poor child her awakening would be sad but this knowledge was mercifully kept from her End of chapter 13 recording by shanna burns